uh, I wanted to maybe jump off this conversation with your article um, on Consortium News, which everyone should follow, talking about, uh, it's called John Kirby versus the Russian military. You talk about how something is happening between Ukraine and Russia that has the U.S. National Security Council spokesperson desperately trying to prepare a U.S. audience for significant developments. Scott, could you talk about what you wrote? Because I think it's a good jump up for what is going on right now in Ukraine. Well, sure. I mean, um, look, I've been saying this for some time now that uh, I wrote an article, again, published in Consortium News in January that predicted this. I said this this year, just using basic military math, um, you know, something I've been doing for a long time, uh, Ukrainian burn rate in terms of casualties is higher than their replenishment rate. Uh, it's not just in terms of human, uh, you know, the, the human aspect, but the material aspect too. They're burning through armor, they're burning through aircraft, they're burning through ammunition at prodigious rates. And the ability to replenish, and again, it's known, there's no secret, this isn't a computer game where you can come in and, and do a hack and, and click on and suddenly see your resources suddenly build up. No, 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 no. If you haven't planned on building ammunition, you ain't building ammunition. And we didn't plan on it. We ain't building it. Ukraine needs it. They're not getting it. Um, it so we we built this 90,000 man uh, army. We gave them tanks. We gave them all the stuff the Ukrainians said they need to carry out a counteroffensive. Meanwhile, Russia is dug into defenses that they're designing specifically to deal with the threat that we've publicly said. The Ukraine, Zeluzhny, the commander of the Ukrainian forces back in December, did an interview with The Economist where he said, I can beat these guys. I can beat them, meaning the Russians. You know, I we can cut through their defenses. And then he did something brilliant. We can sever the land bridge between Crimea and Russia by capturing Melitopol. Now imagine if I'm a Russian listening to that going, hmm. So your primary focus of effort is going to be uh, an assault to break our lines to Melitopol. Guys, bring out the map. Robotino, Tokmak. Okay, keep talking, boss. I'm going to need 12 brigades. He needs 12 brigades. What do we need? Uh, let's 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 get a couple divisions down there. Okay, uh, I need 300 tanks to make sure and a lot of anti-tank weapons, a lot of minefields, a lot of minefields. The bottom line is he told the, the Russians when he was going to attack, where is he going to attack, with how many forces he's going to attack, and the Russians built a defense designed to beat that. And the Russians, in addition to doing that, had not only 300,000 reservists that they mobilized, another 300,000 volunteers came tank, came through. In addition to their biannual conscription, um, they're sitting, the Russians are sitting on around, you know, 700,000 men that aren't committed to this fight, that are available to this fight. Ukraine just mobilized 90,000. They ain't got nothing left. So military math says you're going to get into this fight where Ukraine's already told everybody where they're going. The Russians have built this defense line up and the Ukrainians get chewed up. Now, as that happens, as they burn through, because remember, before there was the Battle of Robotino, there is the Battle of Bakhmut. Does everybody remember the Battle of Bakhmut, the meat grinder in Bakhmut, where all the Ukrainian sold, uh, officers told Zelensky, uh, let's not fight for this town. We don't want to fight for this town. Let's just withdraw from this town. We don't need to do this. And he said, no, reinforce, reinforce. 70,000 dead troops later, the 70,000 that should have been available for this counterattack, but aren't now because they're dead, um, they're gone. So now he chewed up his troops there. He's put his strategic reserves here. They've gotten nowhere. They've died. They're all gone. Um, now they have to continue the pressure because he's under political pressure to keep those F-16s coming in, the M1s coming in. You got to keep that counteroffensive going, even though it's failing. So he keeps pouring troops. But where do they come from? We have to steal them from someplace on the front line. So he looks at me and goes, where's it quiet? Kupiansk. Let's pull a couple brigades out of Kupiansk. Where else? Advika. Let's get some guys out of Advika. Let's bring them down and chew them up here. And the Russians are going, all right, let's attack at Kupiansk, where they took them out. So they start attacking in Kupiansk. Now the Ukrainians are going, oh, damn. But all our guys are down in, uh, in in Robotino. Let's take some more guys out of Advika, send them up to Kupiansk. And the Russians go, now let's attack in Advika. And now they're attacking Advika. And this is what's happening. In Advika, the Russians have rebuilt a Bakhmut-type scenario where they've surrounded this heavily fortified point. There's about 15,000 Ukrainian troops there. 
the Russians aren't going to shut the, the, you know, the call to arms like surround them. Why? You know what happens when you surround somebody? Now you have to fight on two fronts. You've surrounded them. So the guys inside are desperate. They're going to be trying to break it out. The guys on the outside are going to be trying breaking in and you're stuck in the middle. What's that old song from the 70s stuck in the middle with you? You don't want to be stuck in the middle with the Ukrainians in a situation like that. So you keep the gap open so that the Ukrainians have to run a gauntlet of fire to reinforce. So it costs them to stay in. There's the temptation to leave if they want to, and you put them in the horns of a dilemma, which is what the Russians are doing. And they are grinding them up in Edvika. Meanwhile, same things happen in Kupiansk. That's happening. And there's nothing the Ukrainians can do. They don't have any troops left. They've got nothing left. On top of that, the United States has abandoned them like a bad habit, because it is a bad habit. We got the Israeli thing going. All that artillery ammunition that we're building up to send to Ukraine, straight to Israel. The Ukrainians are going, wait a minute, that was promised to us. You ain't getting it. You ain't getting anything. Uh, you're going to get $495 million that Biden's putting in for some fancy stuff that's not even built yet. This war is over. Russia has achieved strategic victory over the Ukrainian armed forces. And that's what John Kirby has to say. Just this time, a couple months ago, he gave us presentation where he's talking about how the Ukrainians were going to recapture all of their territory and how we were supporting that. Well, he ain't talking about that anymore. Now he has to say uh, the Russians are uh, they're, they're, they're going to have some tactical victory. No, John, it's a strategic victory. They might gain some territory. No, John, they're going to gain a lot of territory. Um, the, 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 the entire front has transitioned to Russian momentum. It's the Russians who are dictating the pace of battle. There will be no pause. Everybody was saying, well, there's going to be a break this winter. So we and the Ukrainians can take a deep breath and rebuild and start all over. And the Russians are going, we ain't pausing. We're keeping it going. And now the Ukrainians are panicked. Everybody from Danilov to um, Arestovich uh, to uh, Zeluzhny now just gave an interview with uh, with the economist that says, eh, we sort of lost this thing. Uh, Zelensky's all depressed on Time Magazine. Nobody loves me anymore. I was man of the year last year. Now no one will take my phone call. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm, I've been reduced to a, you know, a Halloween costume. I think uh, Blinken had his kid dressed up as Zelensky. Yeah. You know, so that they're, they're, you know, all this is going to the bottom line is um, the war, you know, look again, people say, well, Scott, you say the war is over, but they're still fighting. I don't know. Do you think most World War II historians, when they look back on, say, the Battle of Kursk, uh, would say that once the Germans burned through their strategic reserves at Kursk, that the war was over, meaning that it was inevitable, we know how it's going to end. And most people say, yep, Germany can't win after that point. I'm telling you right now, Ukraine can't win. They can't win. There's nothing they, do, they can do to win. And you're starting to see already the political pressure being put on Ukraine to accept a ceasefire, to bring it into this conflict. The bad news for Ukraine is that Russia ain't going to end this thing on any terms that are acceptable to the Ukrainians. Russia will dictate the course of the, the, the you know, how this war is going to end. Russia has a goal and objective, not just of the military defeat of Ukraine, which is happening as we speak, but the political defeat of the Zelensky regime. Uh, Banderism will be outlawed. How that's achieved is going to be done through negotiation. Either the Ukrainians will say, we want to hold on to a semblance of autonomy, so we will work a change in the Constitution to ban these right-wing parties, or the Russians are going to go in and physically remove Zelensky, put in their own government, and that's going to happen. But that's the future of Ukraine. They've lost. The best chance they had for peace was back on the 1st of April in 2022, when Vladimir Putin had signed, uh, signed off on a peace deal that would have given them all of Ukrainian territory except Crimea, even the Donbass was up for grabs, meaning there would be a a, 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 a referendum, UN-sponsored referendum for them to decide their fate. Russia had no territorial uh, objectives. No, no, you know, they, they weren't trying to take territory. All they wanted was peace, and they wanted Ukraine never to join NATO. Should have taken that deal, Zelensky. You allowed Boris Johnson to talk you out of it. Now you've lost 20% of your territory permanently. Medvedev said if they continue going, this is the other important aspect of the Kupiansk battle. Because it ain't being fought in Lugansk. It ain't being fought in Donetsk. It ain't being fought in Zaporizhia, Kherson. It's being fought in Kharkov. And this is the beginning of a new round of territorial acquisition by Russia. Uh, I believe that they are going to take Kharkov and they're going to keep Kharkov. Uh, and then they will continue to push 
uh, until they take Nepopetrovsk, they take Mikolaev, they take Odessa. Um, this is the end of Ukraine as a modern nation state, unless Zelensky does the smart thing, which is to sue for peace right now. But if you look at his pathetic little performance in Time magazine, you know, this this is a man who has, you know, he he's he's like an actor that forgot that he's just playing a role in a movie. You know, and he's 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 come off the come off the set and he's gone out to the restaurant and he was playing the king, and he comes to the restaurant and he expects to be treated as a king. No, Zelensky, you've always been an actor. Last year, your job was to play the modern Winston Churchill, but we've got tired of that. We now have to refight the battle of Israel, and we don't have time for your performance. The viewership is down. Advertisers are dropping their money. Uh, we're, just, we're canceling you, Zelensky. We're canceling you. He can't handle being canceled. Here is that cover that you, uh, that Time Magazine article that you're referencing. Uh, nobody believes in victory like I do. Nobody. And then Time Magazine says it's been nearly two years. Russia still controls a fifth of Ukraine's territory. Tens of thousands have been killed. <laughs> Global support for the war is shrinking. The lonely fight of Vladimir Zelensky. So this is act the actual Time Magazine article that we don't have to get into deeply. But it is a huge shift in the way that the media is talking about this. Obviously, how John Kirby is talking about this. I think even just a few weeks ago, Kirby was saying this is the end of the rope for uh, Ukraine. And uh, this is only one year after, as you said, Time Magazine uh, gave, uh, uh, less than a year ago, gave Zelensky the, the Person of the Year award. So so the shift is, is, is stark. And, uh, you know, can the United States and NATO just wash their hands of this? Like, how 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 will this go from here if, you know, Russia is going to continue to pursue its objectives, solidify them, progress? And, uh, you know, the United States hasn't shown any inkling of wanting to participate in a peace process in Zelensky forget about it how is this just going to roll into a slow defeat that's that's quite ugly and it's just going to happen and we're in like a lot of times americans will just say oh that happened whatever or will it be something bigger than that well first of all let's look at uh, historical precedent um in in 2017 2018 uh, the Pentagon went to newly elected President Donald Trump and said, we can win this thing in Afghanistan. And Trump's going, well, dude, you've been there for like 17 years. Uh, why haven't you won it yet? This is very important, Mr. President. This is about existential survival of the West. We have to fight the terrorists there or else we're going to have to fight them here. And we need more troops. We need lots of troops. And Trump went, okay, how many you need? We need, you know, I forget the number. It was a lot. Okay. Uh, and Mr. President, our hands are tied by rules of engagement. We need to you know, unbind the troops so that they can do it. Fine. No rules of engagement. Do it. You guys do whatever you need to do to win. Okay. You want to drop the mother of all bombs on a empty um, valley? Go ahead. Do it. And a year later, he brought them in. He said, how's it going, boys? I gave you everything you want. Well, Mr. President, it wasn't enough. We need more. And he went, no, you guys are the worst soldiers in the world. You don't know how to win a war. And that's the truth. But the point is, the reason why I'm bringing this up is that, you know, General David Petraeus, every general, um, you know, Lloyd Austin, when he was the commander, everybody went to Congress and told Congress how this fight in Afghanistan was of an existential nature, that we had to stay there. It was paramount importance for the national security of the United States. We could not turn our back on Afghanistan. We have committed this path. We must continue. We have to do. Oh, shit. It got inconvenient. Run. August 2021, we left. And we haven't talked about Afghanistan since then. That's how important Afghanistan was to America. It wasn't important at all. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to reality. Ukraine ain't important. We don't care about Ukraine. We don't like the Ukrainians. If we did like the Ukrainians, we would never allow this to happen to them. You don't like a nation and allow them to sacrifice 400 to 500,000 of their own men on a field of battle. You don't abandon them like we're abandoning them now. Um, we will walk away from Ukraine. This is an absolute certainty. We will run away from Ukraine. We will flee Ukraine. 
and Ukraine will collapse and nothing will happen. Why? Because Russia doesn't care about invading nations. Russia cares about the security of Russia. Russia will resolve the Ukraine issue in a way that best benefits Russia, but doesn't threaten the world. Now, they will tell Europe that if you want to normalize relations with us, we need to have that discussion we wanted to have back in on December 17th, 2021, when we handed over two draft treaties. We'd like to resume that conversation about a new European security framework and a you know, proper balance between the legitimate national security interests of Russia and Europe maybe getting NATO infrastructure to withdraw back to 1997 lines, things of that nature. But Russia's not going to invade Poland. Russia's not going to invade the Baltics. That's not what Russia's about. And because Russia's not about that, when we abandon Ukraine, things will stabilize. We will have forgotten all about Ukraine. It, you'll be amazed how quickly all the people in Congress, all the generals, everybody who talked about how this is the end of the world, they'll never talk about it again. They'll talk about something else. Suddenly, they're all going to become Taiwan experts or they're going to become North Korean experts or somewhere else in the world, African experts. But they will never mention Ukraine again. All those generals who made their career fighting in Afghanistan, because understand that was a 20-year war. That means that there are general officers who joined the military and went to Afghanistan as second lieutenants and spent their entire career rotating in and out of Afghanistan, believing that it's the most important. It was their career. Everything they did in Afghanistan defined their career. They ain't talking about Afghanistan anymore. They're done. And I'm here to tell you right now, we will drop Ukraine like the bad habit it is, and we will never talk about it again. Yeah. While the United States definitely won't be dropping its uh, <clears throat> hope for some kind of future uh, where Russia and China are not on the rise and any ways to contain them, that's certainly not going away. Certainly Ukraine is just a, a chip in that process. And if that chip is a, a losing venture, uh, uh, the, it seems like the United States and uh, you know its, it's, it's NATO so-called partners uh, they're willing to uh, abandon ship as soon as it starts to sink. And, and it looks like it's sinking pretty hard. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video. Thank you.